Good evening, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll keep my eye on the waiting room and keep admitting folks as they join. Um, I am Jamie Brooks. I am the principal here at Audrey Kell. I also have with me this evening um, our assistant principal who is in charge of our ninth grade um, and that is Ms. Katie Kofeld. Ms. Kofeld is going to actually help me monitor questions that are in the chat. Um, but the way I wanted to run this evening was to go through mm -hmm. some topics that I think are of the most interest to families. So once I go through each topic, I'll kind of pause and give you a minute to enter any questions into the chat that I did not answer during the time that I was speaking. Um, and I will try to get to as many of those as possible. I am sorry that we canceled the principal session today during the open houses. Um, given all of the numbers and everything with COVID, we just felt like anything that we offered today that um, encouraged people to group in tight places was going to be a bad idea. A lot of schools actually canceled their open houses and went completely virtual. I did not want to do that. I really wanted the kids to be able to come into the building since many of them had never been in the building. Um, but we did um, go ahead and cancel those sessions so that we didn't bring people into tighter spaces. And we also did not distribute agendas or sell PE uniforms for the same reason. We did not want to encourage families to be in small, tight lines inside our gym or our auxiliary gym. So we will take care of all of those things once the school year starts so that we can do it in a structured way um, that maintains distancing. So we thank you for your patience on that. So what I wanted to do was start off and the first thing I'm going to cover is to just kind of talk about what the daily schedule is like at Audrey Kell for any of you all that are new to Audrey Kell um, and just aren't really sure how the day goes in a high school. So we are a 715 to 215 school. I will let you know that for the first several days of school, they have asked us to start dismissal a few minutes early so that we can get our buses out and running. So we will probably start our dismissal more like 205 for the first several days of school, but normally we do go until 2.15. Um, the other thing that we will do, <coughs> excuse me, for the beginning of the school year that will not remain is that we will start the day in homeroom. So our students are assigned to homerooms. Every student when they enter at Audrey Kale gets placed into a homeroom with students in the same grade level as them and they get assigned to a homeroom teacher. And the students stay in that homeroom all four years until they graduate. And that's one way that we take this school that is very large and our current enrollment is 3,556. Uh, we did enroll 20 new families today during open house. But that is one way that we make that very large school seem a bit smaller. And it gives every student in the building that safe adult that they build a relationship with. And the students do go to homeroom every single day. Um, for the beginning of the school year, the first eight days, that's the three days this week and the five days next week, they will start the day in homeroom and they will stay in homeroom for one hour. The reason for that is so that we can acclimate them to Audrey Kell, um, teach them about the policies, the procedures, the routines, do some um, activities to help them get to know their classmates. This is really important for any kids that are new to AK, even that are new in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. It gives them time to get to know the kids in their homeroom and build some relationships with them as well. So that will be how we start the day for the first eight days of school. After homeroom ends and after that first hour, they will then go to first block, second block, third block, and fourth block. So they will go to all of their classes every day. If you did not get a chance to come to open house and get your teacher's school supply list, do not panic. All they really need on Wednesday is some paper and a pen or pencil to write with, and they'll get everything they need from their teachers on Wednesday um, with regards to anything that they might need to bring to class going forward. So don't worry about that. So after the first eight days of school, we will then go to a normal bell schedule, which will still start at 715, but we'll start the day in first block class. And the normal bell schedule is for kids to go to first block, then second block, and then they all go to homeroom after second block, and that's 25 minutes, and then third block and fourth block. So that is what the typical day, go, typical day is. Your student will either have classes that are every day all semester, that's called a four by four, or they'll have an A day, B day class, which means they go every other day all year. And all of that is indicated on their schedule which they got today if they came by. If they did not, they will get that first thing on Wednesday when they go to homeroom. 
and the teacher will spend some time in homeroom teaching them how to read that schedule and make sure that they know exactly where they're going. Um, so that's kind of how the day is, is run here at Audrey Kell. Each of the blocks is about 80 to 85 minutes. They have six minutes between classes. Most of our students choose not to have a locker, um, but if they want a locker, all they need to do is, they actually in high school get to select the locker that they want. So they just need to find a locker, the locker number. And if a locker has got a tie on it, that means it hasn't been assigned to anybody. So they can just find the locker number of the one that they want and come down to the main office and we will take care of getting that locker assigned to them. But it's very, un, it's very different from middle school. A majority of our high school kids don't even ask and don't want a locker. But they do have six minutes to get from um, each class and that is plenty of time. They do have restrooms on every single hallway. And we also have gender neutral restrooms on all floors this year as well. And they'll learn about where those are um, on, in those first days um, in homeroom. Lunch is with third block. So all of our students, they will go to lunch during that third block class. That third block class is significantly longer to accommodate for all four of our lunches. So our lunches are divided into four different sections, um, but they go during that third block time in one of the four assigned lunches. And I'll talk about what lunch is gonna look like um, when we get down to our COVID procedures, which I know is another topic everybody is really um, curious about. The last thing I wanna mention is what do they do in homeroom? I know this has brought lots of questions over the last year. Homeroom has got a, a curriculum that has been adopted by CMS this for this coming school year. The curriculum for homeroom is called the Seven Mindsets, and you are welcome to Google that. It's the number seven and then mindsets.com. Um, I believe, yep, dot com. And those are the lessons that will be used on Tuesdays and Thursdays in homeroom time. And just to read off to you a few of the first ones for the school year, unit one in the seven mindsets curriculum is called Everything is Possible. And the first four lessons that they do are dream big, uh, embrace creativity, think positively, and act and adjust. But if you'd like to see the titles of all of the different lessons that they will do this year in the seven mindsets, you can Google that. So that will take their Tuesdays and Thursdays in homeroom. Their Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in homeroom is study hall and or team building with their teacher. Um, that is also the time that we will do relooping for students that are struggling and will pull get kids for small group instruction. But the Monday, Wednesday, Friday is an additional time for kids to get help to get organized, to study, to get ahead on their homework. We find that the kids really could use just a little bit of that downtime um, and some time in school to get some of their homework done because so many of them have so much going on in the evenings. So that is what the day looks like at Audrey Kell. I'm gonna pause for a minute. The next topic I'm gonna go into is COVID procedures and how that will impact the classroom, the day and lunchtime. But if you have any questions, about just the regular school day. If you could go ahead and put those in the chat right now while I'm admitting the rest of these folks and we'll take any questions you have just about the daily schedule at Audrey Kell. So Ms. Brooks, we have a question about late arrival seniors. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. So if you have a senior who has late arrival, obviously we're starting the day for the first eight days in homeroom. So they need to come. They need to come on time those first eight days because we will be going over all kinds of things that they will need for the school year. What will happen when the bell rings and the kids go to first block and they don't have a first block, they will go down to the cafeteria where they will be housed down there until um, second block begins and then they'll go on about their day. On a normal day after those first eight days, when we start the day in first block, they obviously don't come until their second block class um, begins. That's a great question. And we have not gotten to this one yet, but we've got a really good relevant question about what will be our procedure for issuing Chromebooks, especially among our freshmen. So, Mr. We have a fantastic technology department. I have a technology facilitator. I have a tech associate and a media specialist. And their first task of the school year is to get Chromebooks issued. And they will begin doing that just as soon as all of the students get here. They will do that in a very organized way where they will go homeroom by homeroom. But every single student at AK will be issued a Chromebook and that will start on day one. 
probably won't finish all on day one, but they'll start getting them. Another great question. And so another schedule question, if they have a fully virtual class such as French four, will they participate in that virtual class in the media center or some other location? That is a fantastic question because the only class we have like that is French four. So I believe they're going to the media center, but if you, if the person with that question will send me an email, I will make sure that I find out exactly the procedure for that from my French teacher, who's actually also checking in on those students and make sure I email you back tomorrow and let you know. And then our last two questions, what do kids do between school and evening band sessions? And having had a student in marching band before, I can, I can relate. So that's one. So what they do between the day ending and band is if they have nothing going on here, I don't know what time their band starts. So they either have to go home and come back or sometimes the, like a lot of my coaches and other organizations that have stuff that starts maybe 30 or 45 minutes after the school day ends, they still gather the kids and give them a little study hall time down there together with their team or with their band. Um, but it will kind of depend what time the practice starts and I would have them check with their band director. And then the last golden question, Ms. Brooks, will there be lockout? I will get to that. That's actually one of the topics of the evening. So we'll get there shortly. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and I am going to talk about COVID. There is a handout that is on the school website that is a hopefully fairly easy to read, COVID then and now. So it's a handout that anybody can access and it lets you know what the COVID procedures were last year versus what they are this year. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is that everything that happens at AK is not decided upon by Jamie Brooks. I also don't have control over the practices and the procedures with regards to COVID. It is not my call on whether or not your child is wearing a mask. I have zero control over that. It is also not up to me whether or not we offer your students virtual options such as Zooming. So that is not something I control at the AK house. That is something that actually starts with the governor of North Carolina. The governor had to put a policy in place last year for school systems to be able to offer plan B and plan C, those hybrid plans. There is no such policy on the books this year from the governor. So the first thing that would have to happen to shift all of that with COVID would be a mandate from the governor. Then the governor mandates or puts out uh, possible solutions to school systems and gives them the opportunity to develop plan A, plan B, plan C. If the governor does that, then it goes to the CMS school board and superintendent. So when it funnels down to me, I'm implementing the practices and procedures that have been set forth either by the governor or by the local health department or by the board of education. So with that being said, here is the deal with regards to COVID. We are not checking temperatures at the door. We are not doing bus attestation forms anymore like we did last year. Families are on their honor to check your own health in the morning. If your child is showing symptoms of any kind, then you should not send them to school. But we will not be asking them questions at the door, nor will be, we be taking temperatures. We will have school as normal. And let me remind you, we have 3,556 students in, that are registered currently for Audrey Kell. There is no mandate on six feet of distance in the classrooms, in the hallways, in the bathrooms. It is encouraged that we attempt to keep the students three feet apart as we are able. I can assure you, as I am able, I will keep the students three feet apart in the classrooms. However, I need you to understand, we have certain limitations. If a class has 35 students in it, we will not have them grouped together in clumps and groups. We'll have them in rows, but we cannot have them six feet apart and we will have them three feet apart, like I said, as we are able. The hallways, the hallways will work as normal. There is no one-way hall movement. There is no staggered changing of classes with 3,556 students and trying to get all of the kids to class. We just cannot do that. So we will have all of our staff on duty, moving the kids along from class to class. Last year, the bathrooms were closed and they could only go on a scheduled break. That is not the case this year. The bathrooms are open. They are marked with distancing and the students will be encouraged 
to maintain their distancing and we will do like we always do, which is to step in and out of bathrooms to monitor for safety. Now, I know many of you wanna know about lunch because that is the time of day when their masks will be off. So the, the suggestion to the schools is to keep the students six feet apart when their masks are off. I hope that you can understand that when we have as many students as we have, um, it, it, it gets very, very challenging. So we have had to work through a lot of different problems and procedures to come up with the best plan that we can put into place. So this is what will happen at Audrey Kell for lunch when the school year begins on Wednesday. Every third block teacher will divide their class in half. They will divide them into either an A day group and a B day group or however they want to divide them, but they will divide their group in half. So if they have 30 students in the class, they will have a group of 15, two groups of 15. And what will happen is they will alternate. On one day, half of the class will go down to the cafeteria. We have the cafeteria marked with where students can sit and where they cannot sit. Obviously, we don't come anywhere near housing half of the lunch period in the cafeteria with that kind of distancing at the tables. So they will also continue to eat in other locations where they have eaten in the past at Audrey Kell in the mall area, and that is on the floor. No, I cannot get any additional cafeteria tables. There are no more at the warehouse. I've already tried. They can also eat outside at the picnic tables where there will be somebody on duty, an adult, making sure that they are maintaining their distance out there. Or they can sit in the courtyard at the picnic tables where again, we will be maintaining, have an adult out there to maintain distance. So what you're looking at is half of the kids in the classroom spread apart, half of the kids coming down to the cafeteria, mall, uh, picnic tables outside, picnic tables in the courtyard, picnic tables out front. Now, what do we do if it rains? They can't go outside if it rains. They cannot sit in the rain. So we will use the mall, we will use down the hallways and we will do everything we can within our power to keep them distanced. Now, if they're buying lunch, but it's their day to be in the cafeteria, they can still come down and get their lunch and lunch is free this year for everyone. Lunch and breakfast are free for all students this year. So if they're getting lunch, they go down to the cafeteria, get it, and then they go back up to their classroom. If the classroom, has a, if that's a class that ends up having 18 kids in it and it's too tight, the teacher knows to use the hallway and to spread the kids out in the hallway because an entire hallway would be at lunch at the same time. So it wouldn't be disruptive to um, the other classes to have kids sitting in the hallway. Um, so I wanna also say this, social distancing and maintaining safety is not just the job of the six members of the admin team at Audrey Kell High School. I want you to recognize that with 3,500 students and 200 adults, I don't have one adult that can watch every one student. And with my teachers having to eat in the classroom to monitor half of their class in the classroom, I have a very limited number of adults left because the rest of them are teaching to come down and monitor in the mall, in the cafeteria, the, uh, the outside picnic tables, the courtyard picnic tables and out front picnic tables. There will be at least one adult in all of those areas. There will be. But one adult cannot possibly do all the work of keeping children to the, to the expectation. Your own children need to be held accountable on their own to stay six feet away from their friends. This is not just a Jamie Brooks job. And even more so, if your child is coming home to a place where they are worried because there's a medically fragile person in your home, or they have heightened concerns about COVID, they, they're not vaccinated, they don't wanna get vaccinated, whatever. Your child is between the ages of 14 and 18, and he or she is old enough to know, I need to back up, I'm too close to this friend right now at lunch. So this is a two-way thing, and I just wanna make sure everybody understands that. So that is how lunch will work. Um, we will see how that goes for the first eight days, and we will make adjustments as we, uh, as we see problem spots. And we would eventually like to get to a place where we can have a sign up so that the kids can sign up with their friends for various locations, because we know how important it is for them to be with their friends at lunchtime, even if they're six feet away from them. We just couldn't get all of that done by the first day of school, a sign up sheet. So we had to start somewhere. So this is where we're starting and we will make adjustments as we go. So dismissal will be like a normal dismissal. We will dismiss the kids at the end of the day. And again, it's on the kids to move about and um, get to where they need to get to. 
um, in the in the afternoons. So I've seen a lot of things popping up. So I'm going to pause because I covered a lot with regards to COVID and classrooms and lunch. I've not gotten to COVID quarantining yet. That's the next thing on my agenda. So if you have questions about quarantining, hold tight to those because that's the next thing. But let's pause here, Ms. Kofelt. So I've been able to answer just about every chat question, but there were a couple of serious questions that arose with regards to COVID. I'm gonna table those two questions until you go into more, um, more detail, but just, just so you know, to be on the lookout, obviously our school's procedure for a COVID outbreak. And then um, someone posted um, that the many in their family tested positive as early as yesterday. Do the students stay home? And how will they access course content if they are at home, including homeroom content? Okay, so those are all fantastic questions. And I also saw pop up in the chat, can we still choose virtual school? Let me explain again. I do not have the authority to offer you any kind of virtual school or hybrid here at AK. There is no hybrid, which means there is no Zooming to a kid at home not that does not exist right now that starts at the governor it is not something i can put into place so regardless of whether your child's home sick home quarantine or you just want them to be home they will not be getting zoomed into the classroom from ak if you want virtual education the only option right this minute is to withdraw from audrey kell high school and enroll your child at the virtual academy. It is a separate school from Audrey Kell. It is not, you will not have Audrey Kell teachers. It is the teachers that are assigned to virtual school. They're, they have their own principal, their own assistant principal, their own teachers. But a child at the virtual academy can still participate in extracurricular activities with Audrey Kell, sports and those types of things. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I, I pointed that piece out. I'm sorry, Ms. Kofeld, I got off on that because I saw that question pop up. You said the other question was about the quarantining, nothing else? So, um, yep, so our, our general procedure for if we were to have quote unquote a cluster or an outbreak and then how will, how will students access course content including homeroom if they're out in the next eight days? So the rules with regards to quarantining, let me um, share my screen with you guys for just a minute and just so hopefully you guys can see that. Ms. Kofelt, can you see it? I can see it. Okay, wonderful. So this is across all C of it, CMS. Students that are considered a close contact in a classroom setting or bus will not need to quarantine if face coverings were being worn consistently by the exposed and the infected person, okay? So if your child is in a classroom and they have their mask on consistently, and a child in that class tests positive. If your child has had their mask on, they do not have to quarantine. If your child is vaccinated, they do not have to quarantine, even if the mask came off. So there's the first thing. If someone is fully vaccinated and does not have any symptoms, they do not need to quarantine, even if they live with somebody who is positive. This is coming to me from CMS, which is from the health department folks. So if, your if you had an outbreak at your home and mom and dad both have COVID and you have a 10th grader who is vaccinated and has no symptoms, then they are okay to come to school. So make sure I'm clear on that. So anybody though that is fully vaccinated and starts having symptoms, or takes a positive test, they immediately go into quarantine for the standard 10 days from when the contact, from when the symptoms began. Okay, so what will we do if we have students that test positive here at AK? And I will tell you, I've had them. I've had them this summer with some of our sports teams. We do what we have always done, which is we immediately contact trace. So we will have seating charts in the classroom. We will find out who they were sitting near. We will find out anybody that they were sitting within three to six feet of. If they had their masks on, 
then they don't have to quarantine. If they are vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine. And I had somebody ask me today, my child is vaccinated and my child will be wearing a mask. If somebody in the class ends up with COVID, is my child gonna have to quarantine? The answer is no, unless your child starts having symptoms or you take them for a test and they test positive. So what will we do when somebody does have to quarantine? Or we have a few students that test positive. They will stay home, as we've said, for the 10 days from the day the symptoms started. And I received word today from the district on the expectations of the teachers when a student is on an extended absence due to quarantine or COVID illness. We will code them at school as an extended absence and the teachers will be in contact with the children to set up plans to get their work completed. There is no Zooming. That is not something I'm permitted to do right now, but this is what I will tell you that I've said to my staff. What I expect you to do if your child is quarantined or homesick is to communicate with their teacher and say, hey, I'm gonna be out for the next eight days. I'm in quarantine. The teachers know to have everything on their Canvas page. Many, many, many of my teachers still have recorded lessons from last year. And many of them may still upload those or share them with a child that in indicates, hey, Mr. Smith, I'm home on quarantine. He may say, let me get my, my lessons, my videos from last year, and I will get you access to them. This is why it is important for your child to communicate with the teacher if they're out sick or they're on quarantine. And we will work with them on all of that. We will work with them when they get back on any makeup work. But I will be sharing with my staff tomorrow what has come out from the superintendent as to here is what we need from you teachers if a child is on an extended absence. And what it basically says is good communication with the child and the family so that the child knows what he or she is missing and providing them access to everything on Canvas. And I will tell you again, many of my teachers will probably go above and beyond what the, what the minimum expectation is of CMS if you're communicating with them they will share all of what they've had from last year with you as well. So Ms. Kofeld, does that cover that piece? It does. There's one that's more tech-based, but we can get to that at the end if we don't cover it. Okay. All right, so that, that was what I wanted to talk to you guys about with quarantine and missed, and missed work. Really, the bottom line, it comes down to child communicate with the teacher, okay? And we'll loop the counselors in and we will get that back and forth communication going and using that canvas and making use of anything from last year that our teachers still have ready and on hand. Ms. Brooks, one uh, really important COVID related question arose, are all faculty members vaccinated? Um, just like I cannot ask you if you're vaccinated, I also don't ask all of my staff. So I can tell you right now, I don't know. Um, it's not a mandate for every staff member, just like it's not a mandate for each one of you all. It's not a mandate. But just like with your students, how and when they might have to quarantine is impacted by whether or not they are vaccinated. A teacher that is vaccinated, that is a close contact of a student who gets sick, will not have to quarantine. But a teacher who is not vaccinated and is a close contact, and we have higher restrictions with the staff for the close contact, if they are within six feet of a child who tests positive, even if they both had masks on, if the teacher is not vaccinated, they have to quarantine. There's a heightened level of safety put in place with the adults. So I will not know about a teacher status until I have a situation that might arise in their room and I have to go to them and say, Mr. Smith, this student tested positive, were you within six feet of them? Yes, you were. Okay, are you vaccinated? No, you're not. Then you're quarantined for 10 days. So th there's the answer to that piece. Any other questions in there, Ms. Kofelt? I'll move on. They've all, they've all been addressed thus far other than the tech question, which I'll go ahead and just throw out now. So okay. are students allowed to use their personal laptops and devices in lieu of school issued Chromebooks? Uh, 
we are, as always, telling you that when you are in our building, we strongly encourage the use of our device. Um, I, my own son is a junior in one of our teacher's classes and she has given me her syllabus where she said, she will let you use your home laptop, but one strike you're out. Here's the reasons mom, moms and dads, we can monitor what your child's doing when they're using our Chromebook. If they're sneaking off and doing something they're not supposed to be doing, we can see that on a CMS Chromebook. We cannot see it on the home device. Many of our kids are very trustworthy, but some teachers are gonna say one strike you're out. Now I will tell you what you will hear from my teachers is that 100% of school tests and assessments must be done on the school Chromebook. And that's for communication sake with the Mastery Connect and the Gradebook. So they do have to take their tests on a CMS device. A very important question arose, if a teacher has to quarantine, will they teach from home or will there be an assigned substitute? There will be a substitute. As of right now, and that was also in my memo today, as of today at 6 p.m., there is no work from home option for teachers that are in quarantine or that have COVID. There is no work from home option. So they will be, they will put that absence into the system and substitutes if and when we can find them, will be brought into the building. Um, what ends up happening a lot of times is class coverage, meaning that a teacher during their planning period has to go and cover a class um, where there's a teacher that's out. And just another thing for you, um, just made me think of this when I was saying that with finding spaces to eat at lunchtime, every single classroom in our building is used every single block of the day. That means that when a teacher who has a classroom is on planning, there's another teacher that comes into that room and uses it. Every single classroom at Audrey Kell is used every block of every day. And that includes my media center where we also have two classes and the auxiliary gym and the gymnasium and the auditorium. So when we were trying to find places to move kids and spread them out at lunch, we just don't have additional spaces other than the spaces that I shared with you. All right. Any other questions there? I'm gonna move on to the new grading policy. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. The new grading policy is posted online, but I've made a one pager that I think is just a little bit easier to look at. The district does have a parent copy of the grading policy. This is across CMS. This is not unique to Audrey Kell. Um, and the full plan is on the school website, but we are gonna have this available in all of the classrooms as well. So in the past, there have been two categories for student grades, informal and formal. In the past, informal grades were worth 30% of the average and formal were worth 70%. It will now be broken into three categories known as prepare, rehearse, and perform. Think of it kind of like a sports team. Your performance is the big game. Your prepping, maybe you're lifting weights, your rehearse might be that scrimmage game and the performance is the big game. So that's the three categories that the assignments will be broken into. And this year, excuse me, sorry, I was letting more people in. This year across every single school in CMS, every grade level, every school, everything is out of 100 points, a 100 point scale. So everything is done on that type of percentage scale. You will no longer see one assignment out of 20 points and another assignment out of 30 points and one out of 70 points. Everything will be out of 100 points. That's for consistency. When one teacher does it out of points differently than another teacher in the department, it can skew the grades. So everybody across the district will be doing 100 points. We will accept late work. Late work will be accepted for five points off each day until a week after they've had their performance. So let's think about it like this. If those prepare and rehearse assignments are trying to get them ready for that big performance assignment, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to turn in those little practices three weeks after they've already been tested on it. The whole point of doing them is to get them ready for that performance grade. So we will accept late work for five points off up until a week after they have been tested on that unit topic. At that point, when they turn it in late, it will receive 50 points and nothing more than that. 
So late work versus no credit policy. You know, last year due to the pandemic, students were given 50s for uh, as the lowest grade, even if they never turned in the assignment. That will no longer happen. Any work that is attempted and submitted will receive no lower than a 50. If your child attempts to do the assignment, the lowest grade he or she will receive is a 50. Now the teacher defines attempt. If my son writes down some mess for his English class that has nothing to do with the assignment and turns it in and says, but I attempted it, the teacher has every right to hand it back and say, no, sir, this is not an attempt. You didn't even answer the questions. You just wrote down something. So the teacher defines attempt. If they've attempted it, the lowest they will receive is a 50. So if they do, uh, if they take a test or they turn something in and they make a 22 on it, we will not put a 22 in the grade book. A 50 will go in. If it's a major assignment, they will be given an opportunity to re be retaught and retest on that. Um, and we will always put in the notes section in PowerSchool that if you see a 50, but your child really earned a 22, the notes section will say student actually got a 22 so that you know that they really very much struggled with that assignment, even um, given the extra help with it. But if they never turn something in, if they do not submit it, it will be a zero. And the zero will stay in the grade book. They also cannot wait until the last day of the grading period and all of a sudden bring their teacher 15 assignments and want credit for them. They will have three days prior to the end of the grading period and we will cut off the acceptance of late work at three days prior to the end. That is because my teachers need to look at the work and give it feedback and grade it. And it's too much to ask the teachers on the last day of the grading period to let every child just come in and dump work on their, on their desk. So we're not gonna do that. And again, this is across all of CMS. Performance ca category can always be retaken after a child has gotten some reteaching. These are the major assignments. Our goal here is for your child to learn. If your child makes a 30 on their first math test, we want them to get retaught, re-looped, and then we want them to try again because we want them to learn the material. Where we do not offer retesting are on projects or long-term essays. Why not? Those are performance grades. Yes, but those are also assignments that the teacher has been working alongside the student with throughout a certain amount of time. There have been checkpoints along the way for the project. There have been rough drafts of the essay. So if it's any type of assignment where the teacher had checkpoints along the way and there were miniature pieces of it submitted, then that is essentially the retesting built in. They're not gonna redo the whole essay if they've been getting feedback all along on the essay. So, but on all written tests, yes. And students are required um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I do have a, a high school son and occasionally he might decide, oh, I have a pre-count test today. I think I'm going to be sick. So he decides he's going to be sick and then he thinks he can go to school the next day and not take the test and say, well, I need some more time to prepare. Mm -mm. If your child was in school when the material was taught and they just were sick on the day the test was given, they'll be expected to take the test the day they return to school. So just make sure they know that. So those are kind of the major um, adjustments with the grading policy. We're all out of 100 points now. We are in 20%, um, 30%, and 50%. And we are in, uh, we accept late work for five points off up to a week after the performance grade. And we will give you no lower than a 50 for work attempted, but a zero for work that is never submitted. There are more pieces to this grading plan that you can see if you go onto the website and pull up the full uh, plan. It'll let you know how many grades, the range of grades that we expect to see. For example, every teacher should have three to four performance grades each quarter. Um, that's an expectation. So you can see all of that stuff on the plan. So I'll pause there if there's any questions about the new grading policy. I feel that <laughs> almost all the questions with the exception of a safety <laughs> question, Ms. Brooks, if you want to wait till later to take that one. Okay, so we're good. Yep, and then one just arose. What will be the absence policy? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you mean, will there be recovery if the child misses more than a certain number of days? We have not heard district expectations on recovery. In the past, if a student misses more than a certain number of days, they do have to recover that time, 
either in uh, tutoring or Saturday school. There has been absolutely no word on that right now. Anything else? All right, I'm gonna move on to three other changes to the school, uh, to Audrey Kell that might be of interest to folks. The first one is with regards to the table out front of the school. If you are not new to AK, you might know that when you come over here to drop something off for your student or a teacher has something to leave for you, that there's been a table outside where you leave those things as opposed to coming inside the building. Um, we have made an adjustment to that. I have hired a front office assistant who is gonna man the welcome desk in the front, um, the front lobby of Audrey Kell. I wasn't a big fan of leaving stuff outside as a parent myself. I always worried if I had to leave something for my child, what if it rains? What if it gets wet? What if it gets stolen? Um, so we have adjusted that. So if you have something to leave for your child um, to drop it off, lunch or money or something like that, Come to the front that table will be not there for your use anymore you will buzz the door mr murphy will let you in he will greet you he will find out what you're there for if it's just to drop something off he'll give you a label and he'll show you the table where to place that item which will be inside the building if it's something that needs to go into the main office he will show you and um, take you into the main office um, and so forth and so on so we will no longer have you leaving stuff outside in the weather instead we'll have you bringing that in um, and being greeted by our front office assistant, Mr. Murphy. Um, he, his first day is, tom uh, is tomorrow. So give us a little bit of grace in the first couple days of school as we get him trained in that process. But that is what we're moving towards with regards to you dropping off and picking things up. Um, next thing I wanna mention is dress code because the dress code for Audrey Kell has also adjusted. I will share my screen with you. This will be in um, every child's agenda. And it's pretty simple. This went through our school leadership team last year, including our student government, and was the voice of the students and the parents on the school leadership team. We attempted to make a dress code that is not discriminatory towards male or female and not discriminatory to anybody's cultural uh, opinions or cultural um, uh, habits or things that are in fashion now for our high schoolers. You know, a lot of us people my age, you know, just turned 50, we look at the kids and we think, what on earth are you wearing? And we think it's not appropriate. But gosh, I'd hate for somebody to pull up a picture of me in high school and see some of the things that I thought were a fashion trend at the time that now I think I looked ridiculous in. So we're trying to honor our students' expression of themselves because that that is really important in a kid's high school years. They're trying to figure out who they are. We do want a sense of decorum, but we also want to value all of our students. So here is the here are the rules. We do not want to wear any article that exposes a private body part. It's pretty simple as that. I don't want to see your private body part. And as I explained to the teachers, so what does that mean? What's a private body part? If I can, excuse me for being blunt, if I can see your nipple, that's a private body part. That's a problem. That's a problem. If your shorts are so short that the, the skin, the, the curve of your butt cheek or the top of your thigh, I can see that. That's not appropriate. That's too short. That's a private body part. That's your butt. Not appropriate. So we tried to keep it pretty simple and saying we don't want to see your private body parts. We should not see your undergarments. I don't need to know that a student has on leopard print underwear or a leopard print bra or red, white, and blue Tommy Hill figure boxers. We don't want to see your undergarments. Now, folks, any girl that wears a shirt like this, occasionally their bra strap may slide over. That's not what we're talking about. That happens, we slide it back. But we don't need to be showing our undergarments as if they are clothing or as if they are just there for everybody to see. We don't wear pajamas to school or our bedroom slippers. We may have pajama days when those things are appropriate, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not. We do not wear clothing that is excessively revealing. Well, guys, I know. This is the million dollar question, how we all define excessively revealing. Let me say this, mom and dad, dress code is you. Do you think your child is being excessively revealing? The dress code starts at home. 
And what I've asked my teachers is this, if you feel that a child is excessively revealing with their clothing, let's be gentle, let's be sensitive. Because when they got dressed that morning, they probably felt good about themselves. And one thing we don't need to do anymore with high school kids is to tear down their self-esteem. We can handle them in a respectful manner. The biggest things here are gonna be way too much cleavage or the way too much midriff. And I noticed it today, it's gotta be the fashion statement. You know, if I see your belly button around the middle, is that excessively revealing? In my opinion, no. But if your crop top comes just under your bra and I see this much of your midsection all the way around, that might be excessively revealed. So please keep them covered up to a certain extent that is appropriate for being in a public setting. And let's talk about headgear. We went around and around about why there are rules about headgear in the first place. Why do we say you can't wear a bandana? Somebody told me, oh, because it's gang affiliation. Uh, I'm not buying into that anymore. We don't have a gang issue at Audrey Kell High School. And these days, a true gang could identify any piece of clothing that they wanted to signify their gang, whether it's a bandana, a t-shirt, a sock, anything. So what are the, why do we have headgear rules? And this is what we all came up with. At the end of the day, it's for safety inside this building. I need to know who's in my building. I need to know who they are. I need to make sure that they belong in my building and that I can see their face and I know, okay, yeah, you're one of mine. If I have a fight, I can pull up the security cameras and I can figure out who's who. Now, granted, these masks are gonna make that a little bit challenging, but we have to wear the masks. They cover up the face, they do. And I don't like it, but it, it's a mandate. We have to wear them for safety. But anything else on top of that that can cover the face cannot be worn. So can you wear a sombrero? No because that sombrero is gonna cover up their face. Can I wear a baseball hat? No, because the brim of that baseball hat can go like this. And between that and the mask, I don't know who you are. Well, what about a baseball hat turned around backwards? True, but who's to stop them from turning it back around forward if they wanted to get into some trouble and not be seen on the camera? Does a headband cover up my face? It does not. A girl's headband, a boy's headband does not. So it's fine. What about a do-rag? I've had people say, well, that's nighttime gear. That's what you wear to keep your hair in place while you're sleeping. Guess what? Maybe 20 years ago, but for some of my teenagers, it's a fashion statement. It's not covering up their face. It doesn't have a brim that covers up their face. I can still see their face. It's fine. So. And then of course, any religious or cultural head coverings are always welcome. We do have one caveat and that's any item that poses a disruption to the school environment may also be privy to the to not being worn, excuse me. So what does that mean? What does that mean? If you walk into school with a shirt that says F Biden and the kid beside you has one that says F Trump, to me, both of those could disrupt the school environment. It's not something we need to wear. We don't need to start any kind of mess about things like that. So anything that could be a disruption in that kind of way. Questions about the dress code? So the only question this works is one that two people just asked, are beanies allowed? And I'm not sure if that's similar to, I, I, I'm, I'm not cool enough for that one. I'm not sure. Well, the only, I, I think what I'm, what I'm understanding when I hear beanie are like the toboggans. And the reason I think that's what you're saying is because that was a major fashion statement from some of the kids last year. And so we brought it up to the committees as well. And everybody felt the same way about the beanie toboggan as they do about a do-rag. It doesn't have a brim that's covering the face. Um, it's okay. We've got some, I had a kid last year and we had to tell him every day to take him off. But I really asked myself every time we said, take it off. I said, what was that really hurting? He had a different color one that he wore with every outfit. But because we didn't allow it in the dress code at the time, every day we made him take it off. And I thought, why? It's not hurting anything. And if it's the fashion statement of the year 2021, so, so it is. I, I wore parachute pants. I looked ridiculous. So if that's what you mean by beanies, then it's okay. 
The only other one, Ms. Brooks, and I've gotten this twice, uh, ripped jeans in particular. If the private body part's not showing, mama, I mean, if you, you buy the stuff for them. If you find a pair of jeans that are ripped that you think are appropriate and you don't have a problem with them and you think she looks good to go to school, you are the dress code police. Now, if they're ripped up so much that I see her underwear or I see any private body part like her butt cheek, then I'm gonna talk to her gently and say, uh-uh. But it's a, it's a fashion trend. Again, you know, I, I wore ridiculous things. They're gonna look back someday and say, why did we wear that? But you know, right now they're 16 and 17. And then we got a question about chains. And I think I know the answer to that one, but it couldn't hurt for the whole group to hear. Are chains, chains allowed? I don't have a problem with a chain. Now, if the chain has something hanging on it that is disruptive to school, or it has something hanging on it that is a, a weapon, then obviously we're not gonna wear that. If it's just a chain and it's got a lot of bling on it, I mean, I got, I've got a big old thing on my neck right now. Um, as long as it's not disruptive to the school environment, it's not promoting something that's gonna cause massive disruption and controversy, it's not full of profanity. If they wanna wear a silver chain, a gold chain, they can wear a chain. And that's it for dress code. If we wanna circle back and answer a few that are related I, to prior. The last one, I, last thing on my thing was tardies because I had somebody ask earlier whether there was lockout. Okay, so, so that's similar to one of the questions that okay. goes along with late arrival procedures. Okay. So in the past, there has been a lockout procedure at Audrey Kelp, which means that if you were late to school in the morning, you went to the cafeteria, you were logged in, and most of the time you stayed out of first block and stayed in the cafeteria. And then after a certain number of lockouts, it turned into an after school detention, so forth and so on. Um, then they also did uh, lockouts between classes as well. Um, so we, again, this is something that came up from student government and from our parent SLT group and the overwhelming, um, in fact, I don't even know if anybody disagreed. Everybody felt like, what is our purpose at Audrey Kell High School? It's to educate our students. And we have to meet kids where they are, even if that means they were 10 minutes late. It, it, it's counterproductive to our mission to not let a kid go into the classroom. So we are no longer doing lockout. However, we do have a tardy policy. So basically what will happen is your child will, if they're unexcused tardy, it will be logged. We have a, a, a program called Educator Handbook where we will take note of each time they are tardy. And we're gonna go with basically a three strikes you're out, okay? So first time we're gonna say, hey, this is gonna be my own son, by the way. It's gonna be Carson, you're late, buddy. And they're gonna let the parent know, hey, Miss Brooks, Carson was late today. And I'm gonna say, thank you so much. And I'm gonna fuss at Carson at night. When Carson's tardy the second time, the teacher's gonna say, Carson, bud, you really gotta get up earlier. That's two. And the teacher's gonna let me know again. And now mama's gonna get a little bit more angry with Carson. And then the third time, we're gonna do it one more time. Buddy, this is your last hit. This is it. Three strikes, you're out. Happens again and you're getting after school detention. So one, two, three. You're gonna find out about it. Your child's gonna be warned about it. And then when it hits the fourth time, they're then gonna have a day of after school detention. And then after that, when they hit the fifth time, it's gonna be referred to the grade level administrator. And the grade level administrator will then inter intervene. We'll call you, we'll find out, hey, what's going on? Is there something here that we need to help with? Or is your kid just lazy? Or are they spending too long in the bathroom between classes? What's going on? And if we can't come up with a mutual agreement of what's going on and help the child, and it's just, he needs some more consequences, then the assistant principal will move up the ladder of consequences to maybe three days of after school detention, maybe then a day of in-school suspension, so forth and so on. So we will use a tardy policy instead of locking, um, locking them out. Another question, sort of along those lines, Ms. Brooks, what about nighttime? Will there be nighttime this year? So there is no longer nighttime as you are used to it, where the students sign up and go to a certain location. Again, given COVID and the fact that during nighttime, a large number of kids would go to the auditorium for study hall, we just can't do that. Um, so what we're doing instead are those, and not to mention we have the two days that we have to do the SEL lessons, the seven mindsets. 
So the other three days are gonna be nighttime-ish, meaning they'll still have the opportunity to get help from a teacher. They're just gonna need to tell that teacher, hey, during study hall, could I swing by and see you? It's not gonna be so structured that they go to that room for three weeks, but they can see a teacher and say, hey, during study hall, could, could you help me with this? We've got those three days built in to give that small group help to those that need it, to have them um, get that additional time for working on their homework, for asking questions, but it's not gonna be so deliberate that they sign up and go to a location for three week chunks. And then a really important question that arose earlier, um, specifically with regards to mobile classrooms and building security and whether uh, people coming in from different entry points, will they have access to the building? How will students be given ID cards to enter the building if they're coming from outside? So that was, a, that was an important one. So very similar to those of you coming from JM haven't experienced mobile units because they don't have any on their campus, but Community House obviously has had about 21 of them for the last um, several years. And it's very similar here to there. So we do have student IDs, but their student IDs are not how they will get in and out of the door. They're, between class changes, the doors will be open for them to come inside the building and go back out so that they can flow freely between the mobile units and inside the building. There are also restrooms outside that they can use if they need to go outside. Um, but unlike um, community house, it's not, they probably aren't outside as much during the day. It may be just be one time, whereas at the middle school, sometimes they were out there two or three blocks a day. Um, but yes, there will be doors that they can come back inside from. We do have security cameras all over the building. We also have two security associates um, and the administrative team and the teachers that are monitoring between all of the classes. And Other one thing questions. Keeps, one thing that keeps arising, Ms. Brooks, and I haven't addressed them individually, is just about how accessing grade level supply lists. And I've told them that they need to reach out to individual teachers or wait for that information to come from the individual teacher. Yeah, if it's not on their um, if it's not on their Canvas page or their web page yet, and you can't access it because you maybe don't have your Power School up and running, then um, on the first day of school, the kids will get all of that in their first classes. So, like I said, just come with some paper and pens. Um, and something to write with on the first day, and they'll get all of that from their teachers then. Some of the teachers were distributing that today for those people that came, but you know, many of you may not have. And that's it for right now. So um, the school building, uh, for those of you that wanna know what time the kids can come in on Wednesday, we will not open the doors until 6.45. We will no longer let the kids just hang out in the mall area like they've done in past years because that obviously is a safety concern. So we will let kids in at 645 and then they will be um, going straight down to class. Now, if they need to drop off an instrument for band or orchestra, obviously they can do that. They can go by the cafeteria and get breakfast. That's not a problem at all. They can go by the media center and drop off a book or check out a book. That's not a problem at all. They can swing by a teacher's class and ask an academic question about homework. Not a problem at all but they cannot just hang out in the mall area anymore because of safety. So we will open the doors at 645 and expect all the kids to be in their first block class seated and ready to learn at 715. Another question that keeps arising, Ms. Brooks, are phones during lunchtime in particular? We did allow that last year because we had so few kids that were here and all of the kids, it, things were just so crazy. This year, we're not doing that to start the year because they will be in an area where they can socialize. It is one of the things we will look at after we go through the first week or two. Like I said, we may try to do a sign-up sheet for where they go to eat lunch so that they can sign up with their friends if that helps some of them. But for right this minute, we are not gonna have the phones out at lunchtime. I will tell you, mom and dad, I've been a principal a long time and the majority of the issues I have at school, you've heard me say it at Community House before, it's the cell phones and it's social media. Um, so for right now, the answer is they do, do not have their cell phone out. They can have it with them until they walk into their first block class. They actually can have it on and with them as they're walking in the front door, that is okay. But as soon as they walk into their first block class, it's off and it's put away. 
it doesn't come back on between classes. They don't have their AirPods in uh, between classes because if they've got those in their ears, they're either listening to music or they're listening to, so, so a, to a message on their phone. They don't need to have their Air, AirPods in. They can get their phone back out when they are dismissed at the end of the day as they're walking out to the bus lot in the carpool lane. So once they go into their first block class, it's off and out of sight until that last bell rings at 2.15 and then they can get it back out at that time. So a couple of questions. Um, one is about logging volunteer hours and how will volunteering work, especially with COVID and then the sanitizing of classrooms. How will that work? I've been answered those individually, but it's come up several times now. Okay. So the sanitizing of classrooms will be done at the end of the day every day by the custodial staff. Um, they will not, it will not be done between every single block uh, like it was last year. It will be done once a day at the end of the day by the custodial staff. Um, we do still have the sanitation stations and the um, hand sanitizer stations in the hallways throughout the school building, and those will continue to be there. Um, and what was the other one, Ms. Kofelt? Uh Volunteer hours. Oh, How will the volunteering work? Honestly, that's not that. That's not my my wheelhouse. Um, so I'm not going to be able to help you with that one right now. If you're talking about nights in action, I would say pay attention to the website and reach out to Brandon Webb, who is in charge of nights in action and helps figure out how they tally up their hours for that nights in action um, graduation requirement. Okay, and then we received a question about a teacher on staff who is not, uh, not with us yet. She's been hired, but she's not with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of how will that work in that teacher's absence until that teacher is able to join us? So folks, let me share this with you. Um, we've got several situations. Uh, I'm gonna just be really honest and let you know that finding teachers right now in this country uh, is extremely challenging. Um, we, did, uh, we do still have one vacancy. We do have one Math 2 vacancy. That class is gonna be handled by other Math 2 teachers, a substitute, and the use of Zoom between the two classrooms until we are able to hire somebody. I do have a teacher that we hired from Union County who had to give 30 days notice. She's fantastic. She'll be here on the 20th or 21st. And in the meantime, we have substitutes and the other teachers within that department who have met and have knocked out plans for exactly what's gonna happen, who's gonna do what, who's gonna provide what, who's gonna grade what. I've also got a, um, I've got two English four teachers that are not starting the year with us. One whose child is going through chemotherapy and one who had open heart surgery. So those two teachers, have got, again, substitutes and the rest of the team who have bonded together to assist and to put forth lesson plans and assistance and grading. And I've been able to pick up um, uh, additional substitute to help with some of the grading pieces. So we will always have these types of things. I still have, I have two teachers that are on maternity leave right now. These things will happen throughout the school year and we can't get angry. We, can't, we can be frustrated, but we have to understand that people have life things going on, be it a sick child, be it a baby on the way, be it a baby that just came, be it somebody diagnosed with COVID. But what I need you to understand is that I've got great teachers here and they will work together within their departments. And I have been amazed with how well my English department has jumped in because we've got quite a few English teachers that won't be there for the first week or two. And Ms. Kofelt's in charge of that department. And she can tell you that these folks have got it covered. They've got it covered. Absolutely. Really, really impressive effort of, and teamwork among that group. And if you know anybody or if any of you all want to be a substitute, reach out to me. I'll let you know how you can go about signing up to become a substitute. We are very shorthanded in substitutes. Um, if any of you all uh, know somebody who can teach math or is interested in being a math teacher, I would encourage you to have them reach out to me as well. We are always interested in people that are willing to come in and substitute or teach full time. So a very serious question has arisen and that's regarding obviously Apple watches. A lot of students have Apple watches um, and cell phones, but most importantly, the question is in the event of a school crisis or a school safety issue, uh, if students are not allowed access to their personal devices, how does that work? 
if there's ever a situation that you need to know about, a ConnectEd would come home on all of the different formats, be it email and phone, to you. Just so you know, if we ever had something major serious, like we had a bomb threat in the building, there's many, many times when devices need to actually be off because they can cause issues in a situation like that. If we ever had a situation where the kids needed to get in touch with parents and it wasn't a cell phone concern with the kids turning them on, of course we would allow them to do so. But if you need to be advised of anything going on with regards to an emergency, the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna send out an emergency connected to all the numbers that are in the system to let you know that there's something going on. So this one I've answered individually a few times, so it may benefit answering for Gaming? the whole group. Gaming, Gaming on Chromebooks? Gaming so on Chromebooks. Guys, again, there's a lot of things that the Chromebooks block that your personal devices do not block. When the kids find a way around something, we have to be made aware of it, and then we can have that site blocked. But folks, how good do you do at, at blocking everything your child does on technology at home that you don't want them to do? We're human too, we do the best we can, and we monitor through Dyno when they're using the CMS Chromebooks. When they find a way around something to a gaming site that they've figured out a way to get to, you see it on their history, let us know. We'll see if that's one that can be blocked. Some of the gaming things are actually educational and we do allow them to use those at certain times, the educational ones. And we are caught up on questions thus far. I'll keep, I'll keep writing down and recording notes as you go. Okay, well, I did not have anything else except to let folks know that yes, we do have clubs. Um, we presume they will be running fairly normal this year, but we don't have final word on some of those. Um, give us a little bit, give us a few days to get school up and going before you, we start doing announcements about clubs. There will be active websites for them and they will, the kids really, when they get to high school, have got to listen to the morning announcements. They've got to be proactive for themselves and listen. Mom and dad can't do it for them anymore. So things will start showing up on the morning announcements, probably around Labor Day and beyond with regards to any and all club opportunities. They can always go to the website to find out more and find out who the club sponsor is and always reach out to that teacher as well. I keep seeing smartwatches, question mark, smartwatches, question mark. Mm -hmm. you, guys, I have a smartwatch. You can wear a smartwatch. But I'm going to tell you, if the teacher sees the kid and they're just texting away on the smartwatch, then we're going to address it in the same way that we would a cell phone. And grading for French 4 virtual is done by the virtual teacher. And then some ideas about how many clubs a freshman should participate in. Uh, I'm going to be, here's what I'm going to tell you. And I have a child who is in his second year of college. So I have been through this as a parent. I've seen the low down, dirty and the ugly. It is not about how many. It is about the holistic view of your child. It is not about how many APs can I cram into my kid's schedule? How many clubs can I make them join? How many volunteer things can I make them sign up for? It's more about can a college look at your child's grades and the courses they took and their transcript and all the other things that they were involved in and see a pattern emerge that illustrates something about your child? Is your child really passionate about veterinary medicine? They want to be a vet someday. Are they taking classes that maybe are in that bio realm? Are they volunteering at an animal shelter? Are they doing things that relate to veterinary science? Not have they joined 25 clubs to just check it off a list. They want to see that your child is doing things that align to a passion and an interest that they are eventually going to want to pursue as they go forward. Or in ninth grade, they're looking at two different interests or three. But then in 10th grade, they narrow from that down to maybe, maybe down a little bit because they've learned a little bit of something about themselves. So it's not just a laundry list of look how many I did. It's here's what I'm passionate about and I'm working towards things in that area. 
And we are caught up on questions thus far. Okay, well, we are at 740. It's been about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna hold on just for a second for any last questions you might type in, um, but I really had nothing else. I hopefully covered everything that was on your hearts and minds. And I will, as soon as I figure out how to upload this video with the help of Mr. Wilson, I'll get it to the website. But folks on the website, you can always find everything. They're un everything's under school announcements. And if you go to school announcements and you don't see something, make sure you click on the see more announcements because we're constantly uploading things. So what you'll only see are like the last five that have been uploaded, but all the other things are also there if you click see the other announcements. All of them will be there, but the most recent things that have been added pop to the top, which pushes things down a little bit. Um, so you should see all of those things and all of those policies will be in your student's agenda. Um, we only take money through the online payment system. Um, so go ahead and make sure you pay your student fees through that and that covers all of their agenda and that type of stuff. And then if you will have them bring the receipt to school with them, we will be taking care of getting them their agendas and the other um, things that they've purchased once the school year begins and we can do it in a safe manner. And feel free to donate to the capital campaign, the PTO, um, as you are able, because it's with that that we're able to uh, upgrade our technology, get webcams in the classroom in the event we have to do anything hybrid. Um, we can only do that with the help from you guys. So we appreciate that as well. And football game on Friday night. As of right now, it's on. It's here at the castle against Cuthbertson. And we'd love to see you out there. Go ahead, Ms. Kofelt. Just one real quick, important question about bus capacity. I have not been given any information about bus capacity. And then lots of thank yous for a great session. Well, you are welcome. Thank you for being great families. And I look forward to working with you all and your students this year. And yes, breakfast and lunch are free for everybody. I saw that question pop in. Thank you so much. You can always email me if you have other questions. I saw when our tennis tryouts and those have already happened. Swim tryouts, I have no idea, but I checked the athletics page. Mm -hmm. And lunch is free to all students this year, correct, Ms. Brooks? Yep, free breakfast and lunch this year, free for everybody. Um, student fees, there's not a due date, it's just as soon as you can, and they're on, um, if you go to the uh, AK website, online student payment, I think if you scroll down to the bottom left, that's where it is, you click there, create an account, and then you will actually select your child's homeroom teacher, um, and that's where you'll pay, you'll click their homeroom teacher's name, because the homeroom teacher will then get a list of who's paid from her homeroom. You're welcome, Miss Nielsen. Tell Ryan I said hello. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anything more pop in, so then I am going to stop recording.